Hi. So I'm going to talk about how to compute the edge connectivity of a graph deterministically in near linear time. So we're basically dealing with just simple graphs. So just classic graphs, no parallel edges. We're just dealing with uh, pairs of points. And the edge connectivity of such a graph is the smallest number of edges whose removal will disconnect the graph. So in this graph here, we have we can just take out two edges. We also more we're a lot more looking at the dual, the well the cut defined by just a set of vertices. So this set of vertices is out here, and it has two sides, the set of vertices and the complement, and then we have the cut edges that connect these two sets. And the basic result is that now we can find the edge connectivity, including a minimum cut, deterministically in near linear time. So this is a very classic problem to deal with, uh, has a lot of history. So I'm just going to have n vertices, m edges, the edge connectivity lambda, which is, of course, at most the minimal degree, since we always have the cuts achieved by taking out a single vertex, which is, again, just by averaging at most 2m divided by n. Uh, so it goes all the way back to 61 that uh, Gomery and Hu discovered that you can solve the global min cut by n minus 1 minimum st cut. You just take out an arbitrary source and then you, it has to be on one side and then you have to somehow find a vertex on the other side which could be any of the n minus 1 other vertices. And then you combine that with your favorite st min con algorithm so at the time they could combine with Fort Volkers and then you get this kind of t time bound which involves the size of the cuts. Uh, or you can combine it with the later even and Tarjan algorithm, also for simple graphs like mine, and you get this time bound. So it was not until 73 that somebody came up with an algorithm that was better than just taking n s t min cuts. Okay, so that I can't pronounce the name, but anyhow, he got this kind of time bound, which was rediscovered, but I think it's because of the language this thing was published in. Anyhow, then uh, it took another number of years, uh, almost 20 years, before anybody figured out how to do it for uh, weighted graphs and for multigraphs. So this result here was for simple graphs like mine. Uh, and here the same bound was found by us, but these were more general results, either for directed graphs or simpler algorithms, so all very cool. Um, so one of the things that will be more relevant to this talk, or a sort of thing I will use is just that uh, if we want to mit find out if a graph is k-edge connected, we can always restrict our attention to k-n edges. And that's a simple algorithm where you just take a spanning tree out of the graph and you k times take a maximal spanning forest out of the graph and the edges that you have taken out, they will um, have the same k-edge connectivity or less than the graph you started with. Okay, so this is a very standard thing, but it could be done in linear time even if k is large. Then we have Machula, who showed that you can do a 2 plus epsilon approximation. So two things together say that because you can do this approximation and then find lambda, then you just set k equal to 2 to the, that number. That's an upper bound. Then you can just use that number here. We can always find a graph which has lambda and edges and the same edge connectivity as the original graph. Okay, so that's just standard, but I will just think of the rest of the edges as noise, and I'll pretend they're not there. Uh, so that's what I'm going to assume from now on. Uh, so some history that's more related to what I've been doing here is Gabo. He showed that you can find the global min cut in lambda m time. So the edge connectivity is lambda, which could be as large as n. And we can actually find the min cut in lambda times m. And uh, he also has some slightly better bounds for multigraphs. Uh, well, so this was for simple graphs, but it only gets slightly worse for multigraphs. And again, whenever we talk about lambda, we're always just talking about unweighted graphs, since the edge connectivity is only defined for unweighted graphs. And then Kaka starts doing all his wonderful Monte Carlo stuff. So uh, there's a textbook algorithm which just does these random edge contraction. It's absolutely beautiful. I love that algorithm. Uh, and it gets down to quadratic time, the one together with Stein. And uh, then he started improving on, uh, on a Garbo's bound, getting down to square root lambda. Again, it's Monte Carlo, where you have this problem that it comes with a cut, but it can't guarantee it's the smallest cut. Okay, and there's no way of guaranteeing that. And then finally, he found the global min cut in linear linear time. And it also works with weighted graphs. It was a really nice breakthrough. But as he said, 
we have no way of verifying that we actually have a minimum cost. If you want to be sure, you still have to run Garbo's algorithm. And the result of this paper is that we can find the global min cost deterministically for simple graphs in nearly near time. And there's a log to 12 that I know looks ugly, but nevertheless, just, just how it is. And the funny thing is, actually, I've showed this as Google, and they're actually interested in implementing this. So that, as with many things in theory, they don't work directly, but they're often many important elements in the theoretical construction that can be very relevant in practice when you just want to do general clustering of graphs and stuff like that. Um, but this is a purely pure theory talk. So the underlying result is, uh, well, first, I define a trivial cut as one that just takes out a single vertex. OK, these are sort of the boring ones. And then a non-trivial one is one like this one. Uh, and the basic result is that if we have a simple, simple graph with minimal degree d delta, then nearly in a time we can contract some edges, producing a graph with delta fewer edges, <coughs> preserving all non-trivial min cuts. So for a graph like this one, we can do these contractions here. right? So it's OK to destroy a trivial cut, but we cannot destroy any non-trivial cut. And yet we get a graph with much fewer edges. This look a little bit like specification, but it's not. The new graph will typically be denser because we're contracting edges, so we are getting fewer vertices. Okay. So why is this not for multigraphs? Well, it clearly can't be. Just take a cycle like this one, a four cycle or any cycle, right, where we just put parallel edges. Then any of these cuts here, of which there's a quadratic number here, will actually be a non-trivial min cut, according to the definition. I would say, well, what about without the parallel edges? Then everything, every edge is in a non-trivial min cut. That's true, but I'm not guaranteeing anything here, right? Because I only want to divide by the minimal degrees. So if you look at a cycle, the minimal degree is 2. And the tilde m divided by 2 is probably going to be more than m and not less. OK, so it's only when the degree gets large that this thing here becomes interesting. And if the degree is small, then because lambda is small, then we can just run Garbo's algorithm. So I can assume that the degrees are large. Okay. So when I first have this thing, then we're done. Then I can just ran, run Garbo's min cut or cactus algorithm on, uh, on this contracted graph. If you don't know what cactus is, forget about it. It's just a very nice way of representing all min cuts. And we can do that as well. Right, because again, it runs in lambda. The edge connectivity is still going to be at least the same, or roughly the same. And on m, and because m is so much smaller, it becomes linear. All we have to do at the end is to check against delta to see if, trivial mon if some of the trivial min cuts are actually small or should be included. OK, and then we get everything in near linear time. So how do we get this kind of result? I'm actually going to work with a cut conductance. So the volume of a set of vertices is just the number of edge endpoints in the set. Okay, it may sound funny, I call it volume, but there will be reasons for that later. Okay. And then the edges leaving the set, I just denote with this usual notation, the boundary notation here. And so the conductance of the cut, well, in the, in the case where u is not too large, it's less than half the vertices, then it's just the number of edges leaving u divided by the number of endpoints of edges in u. Okay. And then you just have this symmetric thing. You have to look at the small side. So in case you try to look at the big side, then we just look at the symmetric other side. So that means that the conductance of the cut is of one set is the same as the conductance of the complement. Okay. This is just the definition, but it's a standard thing. It's a thing that relates to edge expansion. So when you don't have edge expansion, it's because you have this low conductance cut. So just as an example, for trivial cuts, the edge expand, the conductance is always one, right? Because every single edge leaves the set because it's a singleton vertex. If it's bigger and you have some edges hiding inside, then you obviously get a smaller conductance. So in this case, it should be one fourth. So these are the non-trivial cuts. And those are the ones I find interesting. Again, the whole thing with min cut, all these things you get by taking out a single vertex, that's trivial. What you're really worried about is if there's some minimum cut hiding inside the graph with lots of things on both sides. They are the ones that are hard to find, and they are the ones we're careful here. Uh, so 
one relation between the two things is that if you have a non-trivial min cut, then it has conductance at most one divided by the minimum degree. And again, we assume the minimum degree is large. By large, it just means a large polylog. It will be something like log to the six or something like that. And why is that? Well, the number of edges leaving S is at least, well, for ed each vertex, it has some degree delta. And then how many edges can stay inside S? That's at most S minus one, right? So we have that bound. And so, and we also know that because it's a min cut, the number of edges leaving it is at most delta, because that was the min degree, which is an upper bound of the min cut. And because the set has at least, has more than one vertex, it was supposed to be non-trivial, then we conclude that S has to be at most, at least delta, okay? So that means the volume is at least delta squared, because the min degree was delta. So that means that we have low conductance. And from now on, again, I'm assuming that the minimum degree is at least log to the six. Otherwise, I'll apply garble. So that's how we say that all uh, non-trivial min cuts have low conductance for sure. So again, that means if you have a perfect expansion, you know that there are no non-trivial min cuts. So the key in this algorithm here will be a subroutine. Well, it's not quite going to be this one. This is a simplified version of it, but it says that nearly in a time we'll either certify that all min cuts of the graph are trivial, or we'll find a cut with low conductance. It just has to be less than one over log m. And again, remember we were, when we had this min cut, we had a conductance which was one divided by log to the six. Okay, so this is a very moderate uh, target. But just, I want to make clear that each of these things, if you just want to do it alone, it's not something we, at least before this talk, knew how to do deterministically. Because the first one to say, certify that all cuts are trivial is actually the same as certifying the edge connectivity, which is the thing we didn't know how to do, where we had to apply Garbo's thing. Because you can just take this graph here, and you want to know if it's four edge connected. Well, if it has a vertex of degree three, then it's not. So assume all degrees are at least four. Then you put a K3, you just attach it to it. And now if this one has a non-trivial min cut. So here we have things, you know, uh, cuts of, trivial cuts of size three. So if this one has a non-trivial min cut, then this thing is not forge connected, right? So it's a very simple reduction. So just to say that this thing is as hard as uh, certifying edge connectivity on its own. And this other thing about finding cuts with small conductance, well, that's also not so easy, at least not the if you want to do page rank, because you have to guess a good start vertex. And that's, again, randomized. Yeah. OK. So now I'm going to describe the overall algorithm. And, and also, I'm going to, this is actually the dirty version of what I presented before. That was also the vanilla thing, but it's not quite enough, because I can't actually assume that all the vertices have full degree. I will be. Recursion down, recursing down, I'm going to lose some edges and stuff like that, but I will at least make sure that in what remains, the minimum degree will be two-fifths of the original minimum degree. And also, instead of taking out, worrying about trivial cuts, I will worry about semi-trivial cuts, where you can take out two vertices and not just one. And I'm still looking for this small conductance. Okay. So suppose I had such a thing. Now I want to show what the overall algorithm would look like just to sort of justify why this certify, justify about why certify and cut is really an important subroutine. So one of these things will again be that if you have certified a component in that way, so that it doesn't have this thing, then I will be able to contract large parts of it. And I want to exploit that because my whole goal is to certify, contract edges to create a, much, a graph with much fewer edges. Okay. So. I start by setting, a, I have this variable graph H, and I start setting it to G. And then I'm looking around for some components that I have not certif certified, right? But I haven't certified this condition here. And then I apply this certifier cut to one of these components. And either it gets certified and I'm done with it, or I get a low conductance cut, right? Because that's what I guaranteed I would do one of these two things. And now I take all these cut edges in this low conductance cut and remove them. And also take away all vertices that have used, lost too many edges. And I just keep this process so when the while loop is done, everything has been certified. And then I contract something I call the cores, which have a lot of edges, inside each of these components. So the most important thing here is note that I'm take, whenever I take out 
Whenever I find a low conductance cut, I take the edges out. That means that these are the edges I will not contract. Right? So I'm sort of working the opposite way around. I'm finding these low conductance cuts, and I say, ooh, that could involve something from a non-trivial min cut, so I better not touch these edges. Right? So at the end of the day, when I contract things, I know that they are not part of low conductance cut, which means that they could not be part of non-trivial min cuts. If it wasn't because I changed the graph a lot in the process, that's what makes it complicated. But let's just see that most edges remain after this process is done. I mean, that's one of the critical things, because one thing is to say, hey, oh, these edges look really dangerous. These could really be interesting. I better not contract. And if I end up saying that about every edge in the graph, I have gained absolutely nothing. So how can I be sure that I don't contract too many? Well, that's something we use all the time. When you remove a low conductance cut, you charge the cut edges to the edges on the smaller side. And each edge can end on the smaller side a logarithmic number of times. And because the conductance was little o of 1 over log n, so that means this is a charge you get on each edge, then you can't end up charging the edges too much. You conclude uh, that most of the edges will still remain. OK. So, so that's it. So we have this process. We find all these edges that could be relevant for some min cut, non-trivial min cuts. And we just don't touch them, put them aside. And we keep going that way. And now we only have these edges we can safely contract. And we know that's the vast majority of the edges. So this is really good news. Now you just want to recurse. But when you recurse, you contract and you create parallel edges. And then everything I've told you doesn't work in general. But it turns out that you don't create too many parallel edges, and somehow things still work out nicely. Uh, and after an up recursion, uh, the analysis shows that you get down to m divided by delta edges. Uh, and of course, there are many details in this. So how do you do that in linear time? Because it's not obvious that even if like the certifier cut algorithm is linear time, no, so, that's, so, so this is what I'm going to focus on doing in this talk here. This, this is the critical one. So I should say, I want the certified cut. I want it to work in nearly linear time. That's what's going to make it exciting. Because if it used a lot longer time, it wouldn't be any good. Then why is the whole recursive thing? Well, you're... so you, you don't necessarily like get a balance split of the graph. That is uh, indeed true. That should be. Well, so I haven't said enough. So yeah, I'm really sort of uh, BSing a little bit here. So the amazing point here is that uh, this algorithm will be so efficient that if it finds a small cut, it will only spend time proportion to a small component. Okay. That's a critical thing. So it's a very good point. So. Yeah, I've put some things on the table. At least I wanted to present a, a correct algorithm, but if you want, uh, and just argue that most of the things remain. So this is a method to identify contractible edges. And for the efficiency, you also need that it's actually really efficient around uh, that, it, that it only pays for the small side of the cut. OK, so very good point. So now we even establish more things about this general algorithm. So I'm now going to return to the toy problem where I'm actually trying to certify that all min cuts are trivial. Not just the symmetry, not all the semi-trivial ones where you took out two vertices, but, uh, but uh, that all min cuts have the form where you just take out a single vertex. OK. And I want to find, or I want to find the cut of low conductors. And we recall that these are both difficult on their own. So we're going to use page rank in the version of Anderson and Chung and Lang uh, to emulate a random walk. So more, normally, page rank is a Monte Carlo randomized algorithm because it needs to guess a good start vertex to find the low conductance cut. Uh, but we only need success if the first point is false. Right? We only need to find the low conductance cut if some non-trivial min cut exists which was these things that we knew had very low conductance and some other nice properties. And this gives us enough structure to get a deterministic algorithm bypassing this whole need of guessing. So to present it, I have to talk a little bit about Anderson, Chung, and Lang. 
uh, but it's absolutely beautiful stuff and I like to talk about it and also nice to talk about other people's work because then you can sort of be openly excited about it and uh, we are having some initial mass distribution think of a probability distribution so we just put mass on the vertices and the total mass is one so this is sort of just representing where a random walk could be, but this is actually the starting distribution. And then we have some strange names. We have a teleportation constant alpha and a slack epsilon. So when the whole thing starts, we're always going to work with some residual mass distribution. And originally, that is just the initial distribution. And then we are going to settle some of the mass, but when we start, we haven't settled anything. The word settled is mine. Um, yeah. Uh, so... The algorithm works non-deterministically. While there's a vertex which has too much residual density, right? So this was the residual mass, and we divide it by the degree. And I don't know if you recall, I call degree volume. So that's why it becomes density. And as long as there's some vertex that has too much residual density, we do a so-called push. And I, first, I want to show you the picture. So we have some residual, red is for residual mass on a vertex. And when we do a push, it's like hitting it with a hammer, right? So you hit it down, and most of it splatters to the sides. And this is a very nice, precise hammer. It splatters exactly evenly on all the neighbors. And some of it, you manage to really hammer so da much down that it got completely firm and will not move again, right? And it, it froze. It became blue, okay? And this is just describing this formally, right? So we take an alpha fraction of the residual mass and knock it down at the vertex to settle it. And then we take the rest and distribute it evenly. Okay, so it's a very simple algorithm. And you keep doing it, right, until we have, do not have too much residual density anywhere. And then you just order the vertices by decreasing density. And then you find the best cut defined by any prefix. So you have any threshold for density, whatever it might be. And everybody who has settled mass above that density, they are one side of the cut. And everybody who is below that threshold, they are on the other side. Okay, so you only have a linear number of cuts to look through. And you can do that in not too much time. And one of the really nice things is if you just look at the definition, because every time you do a push and send things over the edges, you also settle something. And we, you know you're going to settle so a certain amount because we have this epsilon here, it actually follows that the total number of edges you push over is order one divided by alpha epsilon. So no matter how large the original graph is, it totally doesn't matter. You still have a nice combinatorial bound on, I don't know if you call it combinatorial. It's not like I'm not using matrix multiplication or anything like that, but <laughs> you know, you just have a precise simple to state bound on how many edges you end up sending mass over. And you only have to spend constant time for each of these pushes over an edge. I think Anderson and Lang had an extra log factor, but it's unnecessary. Uh, so it's a simple algorithm. We know it's fast. And the only question is, when can we promise anything about it? Because maybe it's just useless, right? When do we know we get a low conductance cut? And to talk about that, we actually need to understand this page rank a little bit better. So. The algorithm we've described is very uh, efficient, uh, simple to describe, but if you want to understand anything, we have to keep just hammering until there's nothing left, which means hammering infinitely many times. We're not going to do it, but we can talk about it in the limits and basically say, what do we get? And the important thing is if you hammer to the limit, so there's nothing left, then you always get the same unique limit distribution. Okay, so it doesn't matter the order in which you do these uh, things, you always end up with exactly the same result. And it's in fact a linear transformation. And it's the one that satisfies this uh, equation. And one more thing we need to know about it is that, this, and that's the typical thing for random walks, that uh, you have a stationary distribution uh, that doesn't change when you do all this hitting around, uh, not at least in the limit, if all the densities are the same. Okay. And this is all of standard about random walks. Good. So then when we understand what the limit distribution is, we're not going to compute it, but it exists as a mathematical uh, measure. Uh, then what Anderson, Chung, and Lang proved was that if it doesn't matter, it, does, it totally doesn't matter how you start, what your initial distribution is, if you can find a set where the limit distribution has a constant larger 
settled mass than uh, that, that it should have by averaging, then we can find a low conductance cut. Okay, so it's kind of funny that the starting point doesn't matter at all, right? So if you get too much concentration anywhere, then uh, you actually find a low conductance cut. So something has stopped the mass from spreading around, and that is a low conductance spot cut, and you can find one of them. Okay, so again, the total mass is one, and just, again, we have 2M edge endpoints, so the total volume is 2M, right, and we compare that with the volume of the set. Okay, so that's this 2M that seems confusing, but it's just because each edge is counted twice. So what they did was that they said, well, if we start putting the, if we have a low conductance cut, and we start putting all the mass on a single vertex, so because I have a total mass of one, if I assign one to one vertex, it means there's nothing left for the rest, then, and it's a random vertex, then we expect to find this concentration. But that's, again, by guessing the right start vertex. And there may be some vertices inside the cut which are really unfortunate because they start off sending a lot of mass to the other side. But here we do not want to guess. So what we're going to prove is that if we have an, if S is not just a low conductance cut but a non-trivial min cut, and we start with putting a mass of one on any vertex inside, then we get this concentration needed to apply this theorem. Okay, so it's not just for random vertex, it's for an arbitrary vertex. Of course, I don't know the non-trivial min cut yet, so this seems useless, but at least it's better somehow, or I'm going to argue that. And then I have a, a new theorem that I think is interesting because it sounds like it should be, it's a metric, but it's much stronger. So it's saying if there's a single vertex that ends up with less limit density than the average for vertex or for the whole graph, then we also get a low conductance cut, right? So up here, we needed to get too much density in the limit by a constant. Down here, we only need to get too little by one or two to the m. So this is a much finer measure. Okay, so it's not just a symmetry thing, it's much stronger, right? And this is sort of interesting that if you look at the places that where the mass doesn't get to, then it's a much more precise thing that's going on than if you look at mass getting stuck. And it's also natural because we're allowed to have an, well, in these examples here, the initial distribution is putting all the mass on a single vertex. And when you do the first hit with the hammer, that vertex gets a disproportional large settled mass. So in order to say something, you really need to argue that a lot of mass gets stuck, and it has to be almost a constant. It can be a little bit less, but that doesn't matter. But when you look at where the mass doesn't go, then you, you have a much tighter, stronger result. Okay, so just I want to just remind you of this. I'm just so proud of the picture, how we do this pushing, right? So again, we take this red thing and we hit it with the hammer and it spreads out like that. And one of the simple lemmas is just that if you have some starting distribution, it doesn't matter what it is, you just have to look at the settled mass on every vertex, then you can easily see how much mass was pushed over the vertex, right? Because every time you send mass across the edge, you settle some mass on each end, which is proportional to the amount you send over. So it's kind of natural that just by looking at the difference in densities on the two, on the two endpoints, you can say exactly how much flow crossed that particular edge. Okay, and that's just because this is the only way mass can move around in the network. Okay. So one of the nice uh, consequences of la that is that if at some point, now I'm here with the residual mass, I know that the sum is less than one, but it doesn't really matter. If you know that the residual density of every vertex is below some sigma, then from this point forward, the total flow over an any edge is at most sigma divided by alpha. Okay, so if we know that we have, and this is sort of a, a kind of nice thing, so it says that when all the residual densities are low enough, then not too much is happening. In the sense that there's not a single, and no single edge can carry too much flow. Of course, if you look at a lot of edges, they may carry a lot of flows, but there's no single edge carrying too much flow from this point forward. And that's again just uh, uh, exploiting that now the residual densities are bounded by the stationary distribution 
where all the densities are sigma, and we know that when we that when we start with one of fi these fixed point distributions, then we're never going to settle more than we start with, so that means that there will be no settlement beyond sigma anywhere, and then we plug that into this lemma here to get this bound on how much flow can go over any edge. Okay, so it's just using the stationary distribution lemma. Okay, so finally we get back to my problem, our problem here. So we are going to start from any vertex on small side of a min cut, and the goal is to argue that no matter which one it is, we're going to find the min cut. And now when everything is in place, it's not so hard to prove. So we know we have a large minimum degree, and we set alpha to be, well, somewhat, le somewhat more than the inverse of that number. And then we look at a min cut, and actually this min cut is only a, it has to be at most a quarter of the total volume. So, so it's, it's, it's not close to being balanced. It is really a small min cut we look at. Not very small, but at most a quarter of the total volume. And then we take an arbitrary vertex and push from it, right? Because I promised it would work, work no matter which vertex we started from. So let's do it. Okay, so here we knocked it with the hammer, it splattered out, and I claim that at most half the mass stays in S. And why is that? Well, it's basically because at least half the neighbors are inside S, because if it had more neighbors outside S, I would move the vertex out and get a smaller cut. And I assumed I had a minimum cut. Right, so that's also the nice thing with low conductance cuts, you can still have some vertices you can move back and forth, but with min cuts, we know that every single vertex has to have at least half its neighbors inside, otherwise we've made a mistake. Okay, so we have a bit more structure here. So, we also know that at this point, no vertex has too much residual mass, right? Because we split, spread the mass out evenly. So it's at most one divided by uh, delta. So that also means that the residual de density is at most one divided by delta squared. And that means that we now have this bound on how much net flow can ever pass over any edge, which was 1 divided by alpha delta squared. But this, we can now ask how much more mass can leave this cut, right? So we know how many edges can leave the cut. That's at most alpha, which is at most delta, right, because it was a min cut. And each of the edges could carry at most 1 divided by alpha delta squared. So this means that we have at most alpha div lambda divided by that number flow crossing the cut, leaving S. And that's a little lower of one flow. So we, at the first, in the first push, we know that after that at least half stayed inside, and then we just lose a little bit more, right? And this is why I want the original volume to be a quarter, at most a quarter, because I've now proved that almost half the mass stays inside. The original volume was only a quarter, so that gives us this, uh, this density excess, which is, least, which is a constant, close to a half, in fact, a, qu a quarter. And then ACL is guaranteed to find a low conductance cut. Okay, so, so it's really easy compared with the general low conductance cut when we have these trivial min cuts. Again, I'm assumed that I could somehow find the vertex inside a non-trivial min cut, and I assumed it was not too big. But let's just look at the more balanced case. That's really easy. Uh, how much time do I have? Well, we actually have time. So there you just say that uh, well, now we're looking at a balanced min cut, which has between uh, a quarter and three quarters of the volume, right? And then we say there has to be at most, there can't be 16 vertices that are incident to more than delta eight cut edges, right? There's at most delta cut edges and you have two endpoints in each of them, so we are guaranteed that the, so if you look at 16 versus one of them can't have too many cut edges incident. And now we just look at 16 arbitrary versus separately, it doesn't matter which one it is, one has most neighbors on the same side by sort of a vast majority and then we do the same argument as before. Okay, so this thing just says that it's very easy to, before with the min cut, when it had small volume, we had to guess a vertex inside, right? But if there's any balanced min cut, then it's totally trivial. We just start from 16 arbitrary vertices, we do our pushing, and we are guaranteed to find a low conductance cut. So we know that there are no balanced 
non-trivial main cause. So what about general non-trivial main cause? So we know we only have to look at volumes which are less than a quarter, that is corresponding to M half. Uh, and suppose for some S we know that, uh, that we only have to worry about finding a min cut with volume at most S. So again, the initial bound is M half. And we're actually in this process only going to uh, look for uh, a non-trivial min cut which has volume between S half and S. So we sort of have some bounds on what we're looking for. And then we're of course going to do that for smaller and smaller S. So what we do know, that was the first thing we proved before was that if, that we can always take an arbitrary vertex and then in time proportional to S, I haven't quite said that, but that's true, uh, we can find if we start with a vertex inside of, of uh, some S prime, w which is a min cut and has volume at less than S, then we will actually find it in this process, right? So we have this subroutine from before that says, take an arbitrary vertex, we can find out if it is in a small enough min cut. That's what we just saw before. So now we again just try a bunch of these vertices and we pick sort of the right number of vertices to to uh, look at. So the critical numbers here, it's m divided by s, and then there's some polylogs. And because we said m divided by s, and we check each one in s time, this is only linear time we're spending on this. Okay? So let's assume that none of this succeeds, because otherwise we would be done. Then all we have to do is to give each of them an initial mass, which is s divided by m, plus some junk. Okay, so we just spread the mass even is our new, until this point, when we looked at initial distributions, we always put all the mass on a single vertex. Now we do something different. We have tested lots of different vertices and we know that none of them are in a non-trivial min cut, in a small enough non-trivial min cut. And now we, just spread the vert now we spread the mass evenly on all of them. And we apply page rank, but again, we know that none of them have a density above this, simply because we spread the mass. Right, we got an extra delta because that's the de degree. And then we're basically done, right? Because we've spread the mass, we have an, a low density to start with, a low residual density. And so that means that the total amount, so if we look at any min cut, we know that no mass starts inside the min cut because if this min cut is, if we had a vertex inside it, we would have been done in the first rounds. Right, so we know all the mass starts outside this min cut S. So if we end up with any mass in here, it has to come, be sent over the cut edges. There are most lambda edges going into S. So that means that the total flow that can enter S is at most lambda times alpha divided by M delta. So that becomes less than S divided by 8M. But we assume that the volume was at least S half. So So that means that the, that the average density in the set S is at most the flow that can enter S from the outside divided by, uh, well, at least we can always divide by the lower bound on the volume, and that gives 1 divided by 4M. And the average density was divided by 2M, and now we can apply the new end game theorem for uh, this uh, page rank thing. Okay, so that's really the whole thing. So again, the algorithm would just look for a non-trivial min cut. It would use a bunch of, a bunch of different verses as starting points. And if it doesn't find that they are inside a min cut, we know we have found a lot of different verses which are not inside min cuts. So now I am looking from an in cut from the perspective of a min cut, and I know that the mass is spread nicely around outside. And because it's being spread enough, I know that no edge can carry a lot of flow after this point. And since I've only a few incoming edges, I know I can't get too much mass, no matter what. And so that means that my density will always stay below basically half the average, which means that we can apply this theorem that says if you're just a little bit off by a constant factor for any single vertex on the amount of density you end up with, then uh, we can find a low conductance cut around you. 
And the sort of nice thing here is in some sense, so we're finding a low conductance cut here, which we're actually going to find one that separates out all the guys who have low, uh, who have low density. So this cut here, here, what we have outside here will be, on the average, half of each of these components. And this is really good for our induction because this means that what will somehow be left will only be a quarter of these things, so the volume will be pushed down. So that's why this thing becomes really efficient. But for now, we are just looking at the toy problem of finding any low conductance cuts. So we are done here, but we're actually doing far more because we have guaranteed that we have taken out most of these low, these vertices that are hard to reach. Okay, so this was sort of showing how we could solve the toy problem, which was finding either a low conductance cut or a, uh, a non-trivial min cut. And then I made some claim about being able to contract things, and now I'll actually do that for the real problem. So it's still the same basic algorithm, but I only, all I know is that uh, I will have a component where all, all vertices have degree at least two-fifths, and that there's no min cut that splits out more than two vertices, because that's what I say I really need. And I'll just show you how to use that. So... We say a vertex is loose if it has less than half its half plus one of its neighbors inside this component, and all of the other vertices are in the core. So it's not a recursive description. It's just you take every vertex, and we want to say, well, some of them may be loose, and they're loose if they have too many neighbors outside. And if they have more than this number of vertices inside, they belong to the core. And then the basic lemma is that we can contract the core preserving all non-trivial min cuts. So why is that? Well, let's just look at an example, right? So here is a uh, here is the graph. Here is the component. So the component is all the thing inside the black circle, and the dotted thing is sort of supposed to be the core. Or so what I'm going to argue is the core. And now we con consider some non-trivial cuts, non-trivial min cuts uh, of the original graph. And it's guaranteed that this cut takes out at most two vertices V and W from, uh, from one side. Right? It can't take more than, uh, yeah, so that was the whole definition we had up here. So... Suppose that one of the verses we have taken out was not loose, right? Because we guarantee we could contract the cores. So our worry would be if one of these verses was part of the core, because then we're not allowed to cut it away, right? I claim I can contract the core, so it better not. And by contracting the core, I want to make sure I don't destroy any non-trivial min cut. So it better be that the core is completely contained on one side of this non-trivial min cut. Otherwise, I'm not allowed to contract it, right? So if it's not loose, so if we have a problem where this vertex is part of the core, then it has at least its degree, v, degree half plus two neighbors inside C. Okay. But at most, one of these neighbors can be outside because we only took out two vertices. So that means that the vertex V has at least DV, half its degree plus one neighbors inside T on the side of the, on, on the core, on the certified component. So that means that we will get for sure a smaller cut if we move V to the other side. So that contradicted it was a min cut. Okay, so it's a very simple argument. So the basic point is just from this argument is that it's very easy to identify a core inside one of these certified components that uh, can be safely contracted. And that was really, uh, I guess, the last thing I want to say about this algorithm. So... Concluding remarks, so we presented a deterministic near-linear time algorithm to find edge connectivity, min cut, and cactus of a graph. And what was, in some sense, the nice thing about it is that we identified this graph where we, we contracted some edges, where we got down to m divided by delta edges, and still preserved all the non-trivial min cuts. And then we could just apply Garbo's algorithms, black box, without even looking what's inside of them, because they have been made efficient now. And... And in fact, it's fairly straightforward to further make sure we contract 
down to a graph with only tilde of n edges. So we can always get that down to that few edges. It's basically using this uh, trick of Nakamoto Ibaraki, which just said that we can assume the original graph has at most n times lambda edges. And what we do, what they do in their witness is that they throw away the remaining edges, but you can also contract all the remaining edges, which is actually a better thing to do. Uh, then you might even be able to recurse and do something better. So we get down to having only order n edges and n divided by delta vertices and still preserving this thing. And in fact, we can preserve all cuts of s at most 2 minus epsilon tie the size of the original cuts. So this thing does not just work for min cuts, it works for approximately min cuts. Okay? So it's uh, pretty powerful. So we can do all this contraction and preserve all all approximately min cuts. Uh, so just one of the nice consequences is we know that the number of min cuts or even cuts which are min cuts within a factor of two, there's only the number of these is the most the quadratic in the number of vertices. That's uh, what could you say well known stuff. And now we know that for the min cuts we get this bound and there are at most n trivial cuts. So now we get this bound on the number of these approximately min cuts. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody knew that the number of min cuts decreased this way with the degree. Okay, so this is just a consequence for pure math, not uh, or, or pure graph theory. Uh, of course, my frustrations here are that I don't know what to do about multigraphs and weighted graphs. I mean, as I say, we ac actually work with multigraphs, we work with multigraphs inside the algorithm, but it's because there are limits to how many parallel edges there can be and stuff like that. And it somehow should be doable, so it's very frustrating. I don't know how to do it. Another thing is I, I feel that this, just this end game stuff, I, I think should be exploited more. I mean, we have all these beautiful applications of page rank, and they always have this sort of, at least those I've seen, they tend to have this, they use it there in the beginning where they have this thing that if we don't get stuck because there's a low conductance cut that stops us, then we find a low conductance thing. And I'm sort of going the other way. I'm saying just take it to the limit, try to spread out the mass and just keep hammering until everything is done, and then you find all in some sense, you find all the low conductance cuts in one. When I say all in one, it's because we can have a small low conductance cut, but if you put two of them together, the, the conductance is not going to get any bigger, right? So you can think of them as these big parallel low conductance cuts. And I think this is a very powerful thing. And of course, the really, really big problem uh, is to do something similar for ST edge connectivity, right? So the classic fault focus, and what does it do? It finds uh, just by augmenting pass, uh, it takes linear time to find the uh, augmenting path, so if you want to find the, the edge connectivity between S and T, you just run the edge connectivity augmenting path, and that takes you lambda, time, S, lambda M times. Okay? We've known how to do this since 56. I think it's time to improve it. Um, there has been some work uh, of uh, Karg and Levin showing that you can actually sparsify this thing using randomization, which I think is really cool. So instead you get lambda times n, but it's still surprising that nobody's been able to beat this, right? We have better bounds, so lambda could be large, and if lambda is large, we have all these combinatorial bounds people have in terms of m and n, but still nobody has a fundamental improvement to Ford Fulkerson for a sparse graph with low connectivity between s and t. So I think this is a, something we should really reconsider. Uh, so, again, yeah, I thought I had one more, okay, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm basically done, so, okay, two seconds, and I was, yeah, well. okay, so we did have a, other linear time answers, and just again, it's really cool with this approximation, so again, we're asking if our graph is safely connected against k arbitrary edge cuts, you have the approximation answer, which says, perhaps not, but almost k half uh, you're safe against, right, that's a two plus epsilon approximation, Kaka. Again, you ask if you're safe, and the answer is again, most likely, but perhaps not. That's what you get out of Monte Carlo. And here we actually, uh, so all these kind of weak answers, they're of course extremely interesting, but we prefer to get exact deterministic solution. So that's what we can do now. Um, and then, I know I don't have time for it, but just uh, for more 
upon without Grimm's uh, come and do a PhD or postdoc in Copenhagen. I have one position uh, coming up next year for two years.